seeing this newspaper clip the other day in the Australian when we went to get our bread um, really triggered us and we uh, came home with our hearts thumping and we um, got to work writing the song Jab the Kids. What's occurred since then is a kind of assumption that we are anti-vax and I just want to say for the record we are not anti-vaccine, we are not pro-vaccine, we are trying to inhabit uh, a place in the middle. Um, we feel very much under threat, particularly in regards to the passport, um, uh, vaccine passports and also vaccinating children. We don't agree with that. It's not that we're against vaccines, but we do have a lot of reserve um, uh, regarding the pharmaceutical industry, regarding the cover-ups and lies around this pandemic, uh, regarding that it looks very likely that science actually, or scientists actually created this pandemic. So to then sort of um, ask us to put our critical faculties on hold and just roll up to have a vaccine just seems a little bit of a, a hard ask for us. So we prepared this video um, of some of the commentators and scientists that we've been listening to over the last 18 months, uh, who we feel give a, um, a bit more of a perspective of what's going on. The evidence is, is, is stacking up that uh, gain of function research um, carried out uh, on behalf of the uh, vaccine industry caused a lab leak um, of a synthetic uh, or a, a, an engineered virus, a virus that had been engineered by humans, obviously incredibly risky stuff that none of us had been, none of us had given permission to uh, do. So the fact that well, scientists, some scientists feel like they can just do risky work is, um, is, is, is quite an insult to many people. So there is no such thing as the science. Um, people keep saying, trust the science. And we can see that um, in some countries, in countries where there is high uh, vaccination, that the, certainly the death rate has, um, has decreased. Um, but we also see that the efficacy is decreasing too, and that there has been some scientists who've been saying that the variants that are getting stronger uh, uh, maybe a, a result of, of the vaccines themselves. So there's so much up in the air about this subject, but we are keeping an open mind and we hope you're keeping well, um, that you're not full of fear, that you are examining broadly and that we hope that this video uh, can be contribute to your investigation into what's really going on in the absence of a truly democratic press. So this was never a conspiracy theory. In fact, that term is simply used to make it go away. It's a, a, an obvious hy hypothesis that is in need of testing, and we are only now, a year in, getting to the point where we can discuss it out loud without being stigmatized. Okay. A big part of the problem, of course, is that we are so politicized, we are so polarized and partisan now as right. a country that if the wrong guy proposed this to begin with, and for half the country it was the wrong guy, then the rest of the country says, no way, no how, we're going to call that a conspiracy theory, and, uh, and we're never going to revisit it. And the fact is, that's not how science works. That is not science. You need to, you need to say, I've got a pattern. I'm going to make some observations, and I'm going to consider every possible explanation on the table. And did it leak from a lab? That was clearly from the beginning a possibility. It raises the question, should we ever be studying viruses in labs this way? if we're just going to create the problem that we're trying to... Well, that battle was taking place before the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. There, was, uh, there were two factions. There was a faction that said we had no choice but to study these viruses and, in fact, to engage in what's called gain-of-function research, where we turbocharge the viruses and make them much more dangerous than they are in the condition we find them. And the argument was that we had to do that in order to know what they would be like in their dangerous form and could perhaps prepare by generating a vaccine. And then there was another faction that said, actually, we're likely to create exactly the disaster we fear. And what was missing from this discussion was a proper evolutionary analysis. Now, the fact is, there are lots of viruses that can escape from nature and infect people. But in general, they don't have a second trick. That mm. is to say, they can infect you, they can make you sick, maybe they can kill you, but they can't jump to the next person.
And so what's really conspicuous about this virus is that it had both tricks from the get-go. It infects people and it jumps well, from one person to the next with no explanation. And now it seems to be having a third trick, which is it's mutating, which of course is not new. Viruses are always mutating. That's why flu shots are very often so ineffective. Right. Because you're getting the vaccine for, that's why I never wanted a flu shot, for the one that was around last year. Sometimes they're, they're as little as 10% effective. But okay, so this one is definitely mutating. We have a lot of them now. Yep. The South African one, the British one, they're, they're all over the world now. Uh, I heard at the beginning of this that they usually get milder viruses as they mutate, because well, they want to survive. They don't want to kill anybody, then they got no host. You might right? expect that a virus that did emerge from a lab that was doing gain of function research would precisely not do the thing that wild type viruses would do, that it might exactly do what we seem to be seeing, get more virulent, get more pathogenic. You think it's getting more virulent, the, well, the mutations? If, if you think about it, the, the expectation amongst those who have been seriously investigating the question of whether this is a gain of function uh, lab escape virus uh, is that the virus would have been passed through either animals in the lab or tissues in the lab in order to use evolution to uh, re-rig it. And that means that effectively tension was put on the virus, pulling it in the direction of certain things. Some of those things were intentional, like infectivity of human cells, which may have given it extra capacities like this, uh, this furin cleavage site that no other virus like this has but SARS-CoV-2 does. Um, so in any case, in an attempt to give it these extra capacities, lots of things will have been uh, inflicted on the virus, including things that we don't think about. Um, so many of the characteristics, the fact that this virus attacks so many different tissues in the body does not seem natural. The fact that it does not, at least at the beginning, did not seem to transmit outdoors nearly at all is very conspicuous. I mean, after all, most animals live outdoors. So a virus right. that seems to be adapted to indoor transmission is a bit conspicuous in this case. But I think Heather's point is, all right, you take the tension off of it. You let it go into the human population. It spreads out. We've now got many millions of individuals with infections. It's now going to move in the direction that makes the most sense for it rather than the most sense for the researchers. So yes, I think there's every possibility that what we are seeing is um, a response to this virus now being free to explore evolutionary space. And this... the common theme is we need an evolutionary perspective on the research that's being done. It seems that there is there are certainly perverse incentives to once you start doing research to try to keep doing that research regardless right. of whether or not it's still good for humanity, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, whether or not this virus emerge from a lab or not actually has implications for how it is likely to behave now that it's out in the world and how therefore we should we should imagine how likely these things are going to be going forward. So we should have been paying attention to the lab theory at the beginning, but we didn't because it was politicized, really is the moral there. Researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology were collecting and researching bad coronaviruses and using humanized mice prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. But the top researcher, Dr. Shi Zhengli, denies she was conducting gain-of-function research. We know uh, from all of the records, from the NIH grant applications, from papers published by the Wuhan Institute of Virology experts, that they were engaged in aggressive research and aggressive work that was making scary pathogenic viruses scarier, better able to infect human cells. Dr. Shi, she says, we did not do gain of function research to increase infectivity, right? She picked out just the one. No, she didn't do to increase infectivity. She did to change the host range to make it infectious to us. Making the disease a virus triggers more deadly is one possible aim of gain-of-function research. Another is to make a virus that would normally only attack animals better able to infect a different type of host, humans. What is making things murky is that different definitions of gain-of-function 
are circulating simultaneously. The reason why it's so confusing and so complicated is because scientists do not know where to draw the line between regular experiments and gain of function experiments that are very concerning. So it's only when there is a potential to cause harm to humans that it becomes gain of function research of concern. But the question into the origins of the pandemic were stifled in early 2020 when an open letter was published in the medical journal, The Lancet. That effectively snuffed out all the debate. They were very well intentioned. But even in the name of those good intentions, engaged in what I call scientific propaganda and thuggery uh, designed to drive uh, consensus when the evidence didn't support that consensus. It was basically trying to shut any scientific debate. And it was quite obvious because there is no way you can reach these conclusions when you don't have data. People said that's a conspiracy theory. That's that's no conspiracy theory. That's an honest scientific possibility. You'll probably note that most people who've been um, shouting down the possibility of a lab leak are virologists. Um, and, you know, I'm not, not casting aspersions here. You know, there's many eminent virologists and we need them and their work is vitally important, in, in um, especially in pandemics. But... Um, you've got to think about vested interests. If this came from a lab, that means that science has led to millions of people dying by accident. So it's a very uncomfortable thing to think about. It's a very, very unpleasant idea for scientists. It wasn't until a group of citizen journalists began to investigate and analyze online databases that the lab leak theory re-emerged. The group, calling themselves Drastic, revealed that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was actively working with SARS-CoV-2 viruses over many years, including the closest known relative to the pandemic virus, using inadequate safety protocols. I think the public needs to be involved. So definitely this problem should not be regulated by scientists and then performed by scientists ourselves. So because the outcomes of a pandemic it's not just that only scientists get sick, everybody gets sick, so it affects the whole globe. Uh, that's why this sort of research where the risks are extremely high, uh, they need to be discussed with non-scientists as well. I think we need community consultation, we need the community engaged and knowledgeable. We actually did some research to find out how much do people in the general community know about this stuff and it's very little. And when you give them the information, sort of factual information, they don't find it acceptable. You know, it, they, they don't find it acceptable to begin with, but the more information you give, you give people, the less acceptable it becomes for them. So I think, you know, we need to involve the community because the community is the most important stakeholder. What's happened in biology is very analogous to cybersecurity, where the technology has just leapt ahead way beyond the governance. The governance, our governance of these things is sitting in the last century, right? But the technology has just steamed ahead. It cannot be that individual scientists are making species-wide decisions. That doesn't mean there's not a very important role for scientists, but we need to have broader, more inclusive, more democratic frameworks for figuring out the best ways forward. There should be transparency. It is not normal that the public didn't know before what was gain of function. The society has the right to know what, what is being done. The worst case scenario is we have another pandemic that's much worse than this one. And we're entering the age of synthetic biology where it's easy to imagine a much more dangerous pathogen than the one we are facing now. This could be a life or death moment for our species. And we have this opportunity uh, of this pandemic, as terrible as it's been, to learn the lessons. And to learn those lessons, we need to do a fearless examination of what went wrong. Dr. Fauci, we don't know whether the pandemic started in a lab in Wuhan or evolved naturally, but we should want to know. Three million people have died from this pandemic, and that should cause us to explore all possibilities. Instead, government authorities, self-interested in continuing gain-of-function research, say there's nothing to see here. 
Gain-of-function research, as you know, is juicing up naturally occurring animal viruses to infect humans. To arrive at the truth, the U.S. government should admit that the Wuhan Virology Institute was experimenting to enhance the coronavirus's ability to infect humans. Juicing up super viruses is not new. Scientists in the U.S. have long known how to mutate animal viruses to infect humans. For years, Dr. Ralph Barrick, a virologist in the U.S., has been collaborating with Dr. Shi Zengli of the Wuhan Virology Institute, sharing his discoveries about how to create super viruses. This gain-of-function research has been funded by the NIH. The collaboration between the U.S. and the Wuhan Virology Institute continues. Doctors Barrick and Shi worked together to insert bat virus spike protein into the backbone of the deadly SARS virus, and then use this man-made supervirus to infect human airway cells. Think about that for a moment. The SARS virus had a 15% mortality. We're fighting a pandemic that has about a 1% mortality. Can you imagine if a SARS virus that's been juiced up and had viral proteins added to it, to the spike protein, if that were released accidentally? Dr. Fauci, do you still support funding of the NIH funding of the lab in Wuhan. Senator Paul, with all due respect, you are entire, entirely and completely incorrect that the NIH has not ever and does not now fund gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Institute Do they fund of Dr. Barrick? We do not fund... Do you fund gain, Dr. Barrett's gain-of-function research? D Dr. Barrett does not do gain-of-function research, and if it is, it's according to the guidelines, and it is being conducted in North Carolina, not in China. You don't think in inserting China. a bat virus spike protein that he got from the Wuhan Institute into the SARS virus is gain-of-function? That you is would not... You in the minority because... At least 200 scientists have signed a statement from the Cambridge Working yeah. Group saying that it is gain of function. Well, it is not. And if you look at the grant and you look at the uh, progress reports, it is not gain of function. Dr. Fauci happens to be a leading advocate of this type of research, gain of function. He supports it. He was instrumental in reauthorizing it domestically in America after it was suspended due to safety concerns. Let me repeat that. Dr. Fauci authorized this kind of research domestically. He allowed American scientists to create more infectious versions of viruses. No research into the origins of the virus will be complete without investigations freely conducted in China. Without investigators having free access to the evidence in China, which we highly doubt is possible anymore. Account suspended. Why is this news? Because this account belongs to Dr. Li Mengyan, a Chinese virologist who has fled China. Dr. Li Mengyan is the same scientist who said that the Wuhan virus was made in a laboratory. We told you about her on Monday. Dr. Li has leveled some very big charges. She claims that the virus was created in a government-controlled lab in Wuhan a Chinese government-controlled lab. She also says that there was a cover-up and that she was told to not speak about it. Her story has been reported the world over. Dr. Lee says she has proof, proof of China's guilt. But Twitter has decided that she's the one who's guilty, guilty of spreading fake news. They've suspended her account. What is the proof that Dr. Lee has? Her scientific report on the origins of the Wuhan virus. The title could not have been more obvious. It says, and I'm quoting, sophisticated laboratory modification rather than natural evolution. The report says the Wuhan virus, and I'm quoting again, shows biological characteristics that are inconsistent with the naturally occurring zoonotic virus. In other words, she says this virus is not natural. It comes from a lab. Her report has three other authors. They all seem to agree. But there are many researchers who don't agree, who question this report. They call it a preprint. What's a preprint? It's a report which has not been peer reviewed. 
We also know in February 2020, a group of 27 prominent public health scientists published this letter saying, we stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. The conspiracy theory they're referring to is one that the virus was man-made or was engineered in this Wuhan lab. We know the lab studies coronaviruses by collecting bats from around China. At the start of the pandemic, one Chinese scientist wrote that the virus probably originated from a laboratory in Wuhan, but that report was then removed. Then in 2020, the Washington Post reported that two years before the pandemic, US officials visited the lab and sent official warnings back to Washington about inadequate safety. The theory is that while carrying out studies, a human in the lab was accidentally infected with the virus. Professor Ravi Gupta picks up the story. Of course, SARS uh, could have spilled over from uh, an animal reservoir, uh, just like other coronaviruses. But uh, the hypothesis also exists that, uh, that uh, a lab uh, in Wuhan that had one of the few high-level containment laboratories in China was also working with coronaviruses from bats and other species. And therefore, that there is a, a realistic possibility that, um, that one of these viruses uh, had managed to escape in, in, in some way. So it should be explored properly, in, in our view. Well, the idea COVID escaped from this lab also gained further attention this week because of a number of US media reports, including this Wall Street Journal article on an as yet unseen US intelligence report. The journal says three researchers from China's Wuhan Institute of Virology became sick enough in November 2019 that they sought hospital care. They had symptoms consistent with both COVID-19 and common seasonal illness, it says. Now, to be clear, those cases would have been one month before any formal cases of COVID-19 were officially reported. Dr. Ai Fen was in her hospital when the patients walked in. It was a disease that no other doctor had seen before. The patients were showing flu-like symptoms, but usual treatment methods were not working on them. So Dr. Ai Fen... She was treating some of the patients herself and she decided to carry out some tests. The result, she said, was shocking. The report called it a SARS coronavirus. Now, the interview says that Dr. Ifen read the report several times to confirm it. Her conclusion did not change. She said that she broke out in a cold sweat. She knew an unprecedented challenge was staring at her. Dr. Ifen circled the diagnosis. She took a photograph of the report and she shared it with a friend. Soon the report was circulated across Wuhan's medical circles. Other doctors began talking about this new virus, this mysterious disease. One of them was Dr. Li Wenliang, the man on your screen. He too received this report. And he's now known as the first whistleblower. Dr. Ifen gave him the whistle, as she puts it. He shared her report further. Soon it emerged on the radar of the Chinese censors. They found out what was being circulated. And this is where the cover-up begins. Dr. Li was pulled up by Chinese officials for sharing the report. He was accused of spreading rumors. And then the Chinese police tracked down Dr. Ai Fen as the source. They told her to stay quiet. First, she received a warning. Her hospital told her to not spread this information. Two days later, she was called before her hospital's disciplinary inspection committee. She was accused of spreading rumours. She was reprimanded. Disciplinary action for raising concerns. Dr. Ifen tried to warn her seniors. She tried to raise an alarm about the Wuhan virus, but her voice was muzzled. The interview says that she knew about human-to-human -human transmission, but no one listened to her. Instead of acting on her report, the Wuhan Central Hospital joined the government's cover-up. The staff was forbidden from passing messages or images about this virus. A few months later, Dr. Ifen got a chance to speak again. Her interview was published in a Chinese magazine called People. And this time, she did not hold anything back. She told everything that she knew, and now nobody knows where she is. The lab wasn't nearly as safe as it needed to be. And the managers at the lab said that they were lobbying for more resources so that they could hire properly trained technicians to safely run the lab. The diplomats were concerned, and they sent two messages back to Washington, D.C. at two different periods of time. They said this lab isn't safe, and, and the State Department should work with the Chinese to tighten security.
Her name is Shi Zhengli. She's made her career out of going into caves, getting coronavirus samples from bats so that she can study them. She's like a top expert on this stuff, and she works in the Wuhan lab. When she heard that there was a coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan, she was in Shanghai at a conference. So she got on a train to rush back to Wuhan. So she's on this train, and later she said in an interview, quote, I wondered if the local health authorities got it wrong by calling it the coronavirus. She's like, something's off here. Wuhan is in central China. And from the Batwoman's extensive study into this, she knows that it's actually southern China where all the bats are and where coronavirus is most likely to jump from animals to humans. Way down here in southern China, that's where COVID-19's cousin SARS broke out in the early 2000s. That's the place where there is an actual major risk of coronavirus jumping from animals. So the Batwoman is on this train shaking her head she literally said in the interview, quote, I had never expected this kind of thing to happen in Wuhan, in central China. This is a thing that happens in southern China, not central China. And then the terrifying thought hit her. She said, quote, could they have come from our lab? Oh, that was her first thought. And as I've been reading accounts from other virologists and epidemiologists around the world who heard of a virus coming out of Wuhan, they thought about the lab. They're like, oh shit, there's a giant lab there with tons of viruses. I wonder if it came from there. What was troubling to me is that even still, there are scientists who are digging in their heels, saying that the case is closed. There is zero evidence that this virus came out of a lab in China. Like this guy, for example. He's a leading expert in animal diseases and disease ecology, and he's been the leader of calling the lab leak hypothesis a fringe conspiracy theory, like since the beginning, when we knew nothing. But here's the thing, this guy has skin in the game. His NGO gets loads of funding to perform research at, wait for it, the Wuhan lab. So of course he doesn't want the Wuhan lab or gain of function research to be smeared. Like this is his home turf where his livelihood and his life's work comes from. And he's the guy we're listening to? Like we're letting this guy lead out on the inquiry about where the origins of COVID come from? Oh, and it gets worse. So the WHO, World Health Organization, sent a group to investigate the origins of COVID a few months ago. And this guy helped lead the team. I mean, he's like a world expert. But guess what? The results of what he came back with were not surprising. A team of international experts investigating the origins of COVID-19 have all but dismissed a theory that the virus came from a lab. And um, talked to people, asked critical questions, got critical answers, and they've come to their conclusion, and I have as well. And what they say is extremely unlikely. But then eventually a journalist calls him out. Given that this report rules out yeah. a lab leak, isn't your credibility on that a little undermined by the fact that you've been saying that even before you came here? No. Yes, you can't go into an investigation with your mind already made up, dude. Especially when millions of dollars of funding for your organization is on the line. For a vaccine to immunize populations effectively against COVID-19, Around 70% of people need to be willing to take it. Trust is absolutely critical. If only part of the population is on board, we're never going to bring this virus to its knees and control this epidemic. On a very different track, what I wanted to talk to you about is the world of science and how the world of science is getting corrupted by big money, and what implications this has. Now, science has had an exalted role in society. It has been considered to be this noble profession that solves problems, that searches for the truth, that addresses public interest, that looks at the poor, this is this noble, exalted position that science has always had in society. And that is the reason why scientists have also been trusted by society, why policymakers will shut their eyes and accept scientific data, scientific research to validate something. And this exalted position of science has been up to a point, and then suddenly 
it began to get corrupted. And we will go through some examples, because you encounter this in your life every day. When big money, when industry, when corporations, when multinationals, when they enter the world of science, they distort it, they create false data, they manipulate science and research to fulfill not the public good, not to serve the public interest, but to maximize profits. There's nothing wrong with maximizing profit, but not with subterfuge, not with deceit, not with corrupting science. Now, I am going to show you how in the big bad world, science uses, or, or, or big money uses science to create the kind of problems that you and I get to face. And there are standard techniques. By now, we know in the last 30, 40, 50 years, we know how this is done. Primarily, these corporations fund research. They give huge grants. They give fellowships to the most prestigious universities, names that you aspire to. I am not going to take names today, but if I were to take names, you would be shattered. Your illusions about these premier research and institutes and universities would be shattered. This is done by funding research to manipulate data. Big money uses money to influence and persuade scientists to write data that was not actually found in experiments. Another technique that they run for is to malign scientists who are doing genuine research and who unfortunately then are producing the kind of data that shows up bad science. They will criticize such research, they will attack such scientists, and because they, are so, they have such deep pockets, they're easily able to influence policy, policy makers, and then ultimately influence legislation. Now, the kind of things that happen, um, I think there are two examples that all of you might even know about. One is the pharmaceutical industry, the big pharma. And big pharma has a lot of blood on its hands. Big Pharma has also done some decent work, but we're talking about how science is corrupted by industry. Now, Big Pharma deals typically with top-notch universities and publishes astonishingly in top-class journals. So think of the best possible journals in your field, and Big Pharma, Big Money, would publish in that to create the kind of credibility that's difficult to counter. You may have come across a viral news item of Nobel laureate Lou Montaigne, in which it is purported that the scientist claimed that whosoever took the COVID-19 vaccine will die in two years. If you have not come across it, then you can mark yourself safe from fake news. But this is what the Nobel laureate said. The Nobel laureate has called mass vaccination against coronavirus during the pandemic unthinkable and a historic blunder that is creating the variants and leading to deaths from the disease. He has also raised concerns about antibody-dependent enhancement or ADE. ADE is a phenomenon where antibodies formed can be beneficial to the virus and for its self-replication. However, this is of course not the norm and a rarer instance. Antibodies mainly help fight the viral infection. However, the scientist Liu Montagnier has never said that people who got vaccinated will die within two years. That is a complete fabrication. Anyhow, it is pertinent to mention here that Liu Montagnier is a controversy's child. Last year, he'd said that the deadly coronavirus was manufactured in a laboratory in China's Wuhan. Hey everyone, so I've been wanting to put out something for a while about YouTube censorship, the topics of ivermectin and vaccines, and particularly how much has been centred around Brett Weinstein's Dark Horse podcast, which has had several videos taken down and censored, has had both their channels demonetized. So I've been working on it for quite a while, mainly trying to get key people in dialogue with each other 
Also, we just put out a newsletter on it a few days ago about the uncanny valley between the mainstream and the alternative. But in the meantime, things have been moving. For example, this article yesterday in Quillette, which was co-authored by Yuri Dagin, who's an independent researcher we've had on this channel, Brett has had on his channel, who did a lot to uncover evidence about the lab leak hypothesis. Partly why I haven't put anything out on the channel is that it's actually very, very complex. The free speech censorship dimension is pretty clear, that the social media platform shouldn't be censoring good faith discussions, but the marketplace of ideas is broken at a much deeper level than that. So the following film is a conversation we just had in the Rebel Wisdom digital campfire, where I try and kind of dig into as many of the different threads as I can, respond to a few questions, and also a dialogue with a couple of other friends who have been looking at this as well. So I hope this is a useful framing. What's fascinating about this topic and this story is all of the issues with the information ecology that we've been talking about, the problems of sense making, come into really sharp contrast. And also I feel I haven't talked about it on the channel yet. I've been working quite hard on various angles of this. I've been looking at different medical figures, researching it. I haven't put anything out. I think I also feel that absence on the channel. Like I haven't put out anything. Uh, I put out something on Twitter basically saying that I disagree with the censorship. So I'll start by saying, I'll probably talk for, 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 for a while first, and then we'll go into a bit of dialogue, and then we'll go to questions and more of an open conversation towards the end. But, I, but part of this is also um, to, to try and explain what I'm making of things with what I've been able to put together so far, but also why this is such a complicated situation. Um, and part of that is because this dynamic almost always falls into the free speech censorship issue, this sort of binary of free speech and censorship. And I think that's really not a helpful frame to look at this, even though I would fully agree that it's not up to the tech platforms to decide what we should and shouldn't talk about. I can't actually come down on a completely sort of free speech absolutist position on that. And I think if you do, you haven't really understood like how dark things can get online. There are, for example, communities of people, Facebook groups that advise um, parents with kids with autism to feed them bleach. And if and when the obvious happens and they start coming out in all sorts of rashes and have all those problems, like, oh, that's just the toxins coming out. And so Facebook shuts down those groups. It censors that content. I'm making that point to say that I think there is a line. I don't think that Brett's content crosses it. I think that we need to be able to talk about things like ivermectin and vaccines, partly because you can't gatekeep that kind of conversation out anymore. And I think, I don't know how many people read the, the, the newsletter we put out recently where I, we tried to kind of go in a little bit more depth than is often possible on YouTube and talk about the uncanny valley between the mainstream and the alternative. That for me is the key issue that we're dealing with is that we have these alternative claims that are not being checked because they're basically turning up on podcasts where there's no incentive structure to challenge them. And then we have a mainstream that won't platform those perspectives for fear of false equivalence. And we've just got this massive gap in the middle where it's awfully difficult to find out what's true and to evaluate truth claims. Let's start with Peter Daszak, an old friend of virologist Shi Zhengli from the Wuhan lab. On June 22nd, the leading British medical journal The Lancet updated the COVID commissioner profiles and released a statement saying, The Lancet COVID-19 commission will carefully scrutinize the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in advance of its final report. The Commission's technical work will be conducted by independent experts who were not directly involved in U.S.-China research activities that are under scrutiny. Dr. Peter Daszak has recused himself from the Commission's work on the origins of the virus. The word recused itself is a bit vague, isn't it? Did he recuse himself out of professional ethics, or was he removed by the rest of the Commissioners? As we all know, The Lancet published an open letter last year signed by 27 scientists claiming that the lab theory was a conspiracy. 
However, on June 21st, the Lancet changed its view in its latest statement, saying that one of the leading virologists who signed the original letter, U.S. researcher Peter Daszak, failed to disclose competing interests as required by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. Daszak promptly submitted a statement in his defense claiming he was solely in the form of salary from Eco House Alliance. But the next day, he changed his attitude and recused himself. Many reported that he was removed. And I agree. The Lancer's change of attitude is a significant event. As we all know, the joint open letter manipulated by Peter Daszak played an important role in labeling the lab-made virus as a conspiracy theory. Now the Lancet cut ties with Daszak and sent a clear signal of implicit denial of the previous open letter signed by 27 people. They readjusted their position to treat the lab theory and the natural evolution as equally unproven. Daszak is in a similar situation with Shi Zhengli. More and more evidence proves that he lied. Previously, he denied that there were bats inside Wuhan Institute of Virology. He also claimed that he has never been involved in gain-of-function experiments conducted at the Wuhan lab. However, a reporter dug up a couple of tweets that Daszak published on October 2, 2018. In the tweets, Daszak clearly mentioned that Shi Zhengli and his team found a series of SARS-related coronaviruses in a bat cave in the Yunnan province of China. He tweeted, These viruses include those able to bind with ACE2, the human cell surface receptors for SARS-CoV, and able to infect and cause illnesses in the humanized mouse SARS model. Wouldn't these types of experiments be considered gain-of-functions experiments? Daszak not only knew about the experiments, but also participated in them. He should be considered the second suspect to be held responsible for the outbreak of this pandemic. It is worth mentioning that YouTube is part of a consortium. It is partnered with Twitter, Facebook, Reuters, AP, Financial Times, Washington Post, some other notable organizations, and that this group has appointed itself the arbiter of truth. In effect, they have decided to control discussion ostensibly to prevent the distribution of misinformation. Mm -hmm. Now, how have they chosen to do that? In this case, they have chosen to simply utilize the recommendations of the WHO and the CDC and apply them as if they are synonymous with scientific truth. Problem, even at their best, the WHO and CDC are not scientific entities. They are entities that are about public health. And public health has this, whether it's right or not, and I believe I disagree with it, but it has this uh, self-assigned right to lie that comes from the fact that there is game theory that works against, for example, a successful vaccination campaign. That if everybody else takes a vaccine and therefore the herd becomes immune through vaccination and you decide not to take a vaccine, then you benefit from the immunity of the herd without having taken the risk. So the people who do best are the people who opt out. That's a hazard, and the WHO and CDC as public health entities effectively um, oversimplify stories in order that that game theory does not cause a predictable tragedy of the commons. With that said, once that right to lie exists, then it finds out ser it turns out to serve the interests of, for example, pharmaceutical companies, which have emergency use authorizations that require that there not be a safe and effective treatment and have immunity from liability for harms caused by their product. So that's a recipe for disaster, right? You, you don't need to be a sophisticated uh, thinker about complex systems to see the hazard of immunizing uh, a company from the harm of its own product at the same time that that product can only exist in the market if some other product that works better uh, somehow fails to be noticed. 
So somehow YouTube is doing the bidding of Merck and others. Whether it knows that that's what it's doing, I have no idea. I think this may be another case of an autopilot that thinks it's doing the right thing because it's parroting the uh, corrupt wisdom of the WHO and the CDC, but the WHO and the CDC have been wrong again and again in this pandemic. And the irony here is that with YouTube coming after me, well, my channel has been right where the WHO and CDC have been wrong consistently over the whole pandemic. So how is it that YouTube is censoring us because the WHO and CDC disagree with us when in fact in past disagreements we've been right and they've been wrong? There's so much to talk about here. So I've heard this many times actually on the inside of YouTube and with colleagues that I've talked about, talked with is they kind of in a very casual way say they're job is simply to uh, slow or prevent the spread of misinformation. And they say like, that's an easy thing to do. Like to know what is true or not is an easy thing to do. And so from the YouTube perspective, I think they basically outsource of, of the, the task of knowing what is true or not to public institutions that on a basic Google search claim to be the arbiters of truth. So if you were YouTube who are exceptionally profitable and exceptionally powerful in terms of uh, controlling what people get to see or not, what would you do? Would you take a stand, a public stand against the WHO, who CDC, or would you instead say, you know what, let's open the dam and let any video on anything fly. What do you, what do, you do here? If you say you were put, if Brett Weinstein was put in charge of YouTube for a month in this most critical of times where YouTube actually has incredible amounts of power to educate the populace, uh, to give power of knowledge to the populace, such that they can reform institutions. What would you do? How would you run YouTube? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately, this is actually quite simple. The founders, the American founders, settled on a counterintuitive formulation that people should be free to say anything. They should be free from the government blocking them from doing so. They did not imagine that in formulating that right, that most of what was said would be of high quality nor did they imagine it would be free of harmful things. What they correctly reasoned was that the benefit of leaving everything so it can be said exceeds the cost, which everyone understands to be substantial. What I would say is they could not have anticipated the impact, the centrality of platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc. If they had, they would not have limited the First Amendment as they did. They clearly understood that the power of the federal government was so great that it needed to be limited by granting explicitly the right of citizens to say anything. In fact, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook may be more powerful in this moment than the federal government of their worst nightmares could have been. The power that these entities have to control thought and to shift civilization is so great that we need to have those same protections. It doesn't mean that harmful things won't be said, but it means that nothing has changed about the cost benefit analysis of building the right to censor. So if I were running YouTube, the limit of what should be allowed is the limit of the law, right? If what you are doing is legal, then it should not be YouTube's place to limit what gets said or who gets to hear it. That is between Speakers and audience, will harm come from that? Of course it will. But will net harm come from it? No, I don't believe it will. I believe that allowing everything to be said does allow a process in which better ideas do come to the fore and win out. So you believe that in the end, when there's complete freedom to share ideas, that truth will win out. So what I've noticed, just a, a, as a brief side comment, that certain things become viral irregardless of their truth. I, I've noticed that things that are dramatic and or funny 
Like things that become memes are not, don't have to be grounded in truth. And so that what worries me there is that we basically maximize for drama versus maximize for truth in a system where everything is free. And that's worrying in the time of emergency. Well, yes, it's all worrying in time of emergency, <laughs> to be sure. But I want you to notice that what you've happened on is actually an analog for a much deeper and older problem. Human beings are the, we are not a blank slate, but we are the blankest slate that nature has ever devised. And there's a reason for that, right? It's where our flexibility comes from. We have effectively, we are robots in which the a large fraction of the cognitive capacity has been, or of the behavioral capacity has been offloaded to the software layer, which gets written and rewritten over evolutionary time. That means effectively that much of what we are, in fact, the important part of what we are is housed in the, in the cultural layer and the conscious layer and not in the hardware hard coding layer. That layer is prone to make errors. Right, And anybody who's watched a child grow up knows that children make absurd errors all the time. Right, That's part of the process, as we were discussing earlier. It is also true that as you look across a field of people discussing things, a lot of what is said is pure nonsense. It's garbage. But the tendency of garbage to emerge and even to spread in the short term does not say that over the long term, what sticks is not the valuable ideas. So there is a high tendency for uh, novelty to be created in the cultural space, but there's also a high tendency for it to go extinct. And you have to keep that in mind. It's not like the genome, right? Everything is happening at a much higher rate. It, things are being created, they're being destroyed. And I can't say that, you know, I mean, obviously we've seen totalitarianism arise many times and it's very destructive each time it does. So it's not like, hey, freedom to come up with any idea you want hasn't produced a whole lot of carnage. But the question is over time, does it produce mm. more open, fairer, more decent societies? And I believe that it does. I can't prove it, but that does seem to be the pattern. I, I believe so as well. The thing is in the short term, freedom of speech, absolute freedom of speech can be quite destructive but you nevertheless have to hold on to that because in the long term, I, I think you and I, I guess, are optimistic in the sense that um, good ideas will win out. I don't know how strongly I believe that it will work, but I will say I haven't heard a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I would also point out that there's something very significant in this question of the hubris involved in imagining that you're going to improve the discussion by censoring, which is the majority of concepts at the fringe are nonsense. That's automatic. But the heterodoxy at the fringe, which is indistinguishable at the beginning from the nonsense ideas, is the key to progress. So if you decide, hey, the fringe is 99% garbage, let's just get rid of it, right? Hey, that's a strong win. We're getting rid of 99% garbage for 1% something or other. Okay. And the point is, yeah, but that 1% something or other is the key. You're throwing out the key. And so that's what YouTube is doing. Frankly, I think at the point that it started censoring my channel, you know, in the immediate aftermath of this major reversal of lab, for lab leak, it should have looked at itself and said, well, what the hell are we doing? Who are we censoring? We we're censoring somebody who was just right, right? In a conflict with the very same people on whose behalf we are now censoring, right? That should have caused them to wake up. So you said one approach if you were on YouTube was just basically let all videos go that do not violate the law. Well, I should fix that, yeah. okay? I believe that that is the basic principle. Yeah. Eric makes an excellent point about the distinction between ideas and personal attacks, doxing, right. these other things. So I agree, there's no value in allowing people to destroy each other's lives, even if there's a technical uh, legal defense for it. Now, how you draw that line, I don't know. But you know what I'm talking about is, yes, people should be free to traffic in bad ideas and they should be free to expose that the ideas are bad. And hopefully that process results in better ideas winning out.